Hey Spirit Life, I've got a real treat for you today. I'm going to introduce one of my friends and one of the biggest supporters of this channel, Joshua, as a special guest to do a really awesome commentary on some of the media that's already out and some of the movies that are on their way. So you can decide whether or not you want to watch something. I get questions all the time, should I watch or should I not? And mostly my focus has just been a discussion about the Christian themes, and Joshua has a little bit of that. There's been some people throughout the years who've helped me behind the scenes on the channel. I'm thinking of like David Williams, thank you so much for all you've done. But this has been a crucial time because I just moved from Atlanta to North Carolina where I'm a new pastor. I'm getting ready for Resurrection Sunday, so it's really helpful to have a little bit of support. And I think you'll like Joshua's demonstration of what's to be regarded as uh, kind of a wary approach of movies, what's to be embraced as like, hey, this is going to be a good family movie that everybody can enjoy, and what's to be avoided altogether. I think you'll like his rating system, and I think you'll enjoy some of his commentary, especially at the end. Take it away, Joshua. Spirit Life. Hey everyone, it's Joshua from Spirit Life. I had an idea today that start every three months for the current season, I will start reviewing media from a Christian perspective so you know what you might or might not want around your family, children, friends, so on and so forth. So what I'm going to be doing here is I'm going to be giving content warnings that you get in the rating and stuff for Christians that you might not see on a label. Once we've completed that, we will then move on to give the product a rating, a rating from one to three. One is whatsoever is of good report, whatsoever things are pure and lovely. This is something that you should feel no shame about bringing into your health, and I absolutely recommend. Two is going to be watch and pray. Essentially, this is media that doesn't have enough information or isn't quite clear, or maybe even ambiguous. The third option is going to be the marketplace. Essentially, this is anything that should not be near the Christian, primarily for spiritual reasons. First up on our film is Creed 3, otherwise known to me as Rocky 8. If you're familiar with Sylvester Stallone's Rocky franchise, you already pretty much know what you're getting yourself into, but for those of you who don't, this is a franchise of boxing move. The majority of these films are not actually spent in a boxing ring, but you are going to have extended you know, competitive matches of two men in a ring beating a stun out of each other. I'm going to be giving this one a watch and pray because otherwise, outside of the violence, all you'd have to contend with most likely, I'm going to say, would be the language. These films never have a lot of sexuality. There were two horror movies released, both of which were extremely graphic. Scream 6, of course, was rated R. I don't know if Unseen has been released yet, but it is a Blumhouse horror production, so you can pretty much expect about as violent as you can get in a horror picture without going full R. So these are pretty cut and dry. I wouldn't be shocked if these films individually were both filled with a decent amount of demonology or the occult. I'm not quite sure what the Scream franchise is about, but I think it's about the soul of the dead. So that's something to keep in mind. Your Christian experience watching 65 is really going to come down to two things. First and foremost, are you personally offended when the evolution message, as well as possible denial of the existence of God, rub you the wrong way? If it does, 65 is most likely not for you, as this film takes place, of course, 65 million years ago. Not from the Christian perspective of what happened 6,000 years ago, let alone 65 million. On a less spiritual and more physical note, the film also is filled from start to finish with startling, constant, and very sudden noises. And I don't even have heart issues, and this film gave me some pretty serious pain. Maybe it was my attachment to the first film that blinded me, but perhaps I should have expected a movie subtitled Fury of the Gods to be this blasphemous. Of course, without going into the fact that the main villain is a holy trinity, consisting of sisters with an elder sister, a younger sister, the same age as her daughter would have been, and the mediator between the gods and men. Stat doesn't just scream holy trinity to you right there. Shazam! Fury of the Gods takes things a little higher than that though, by confirming that the seven powers, or six powers, I don't remember, that make up the word Shazam were all in of themselves gods, not merely elders as the first film portrayed them. What this does for us, 
especially considering that the first word in Shazam is Solomon, is it equates the wisdom of Solomon to the wisdom of man, and not the wisdom of a righteous god who imparted it to him. Quite frankly, this is an incredibly harmful message. Especially when the life of Solomon is strictly examined, and we see where the wisdom of man gets you. This isn't a small detail either. The wisdom of Solomon is a key plot point in not only Billy Batson's development in this film, but the plot as a whole. John Wick films are noted for and notorious for their extreme hyperviolence. I have only seen the first film in this franchise, but I can assure you there is no plot, at least in that film. It is all and exclusively hyperviolence. The film centers a ex-hitman uh, out for revenge after his dog is killed. There is hard language and a great deal of sexuality in the surroundings. Uh, he goes to a strip club in the first film, so I can imagine that might return here. But as far as the first film is concerned, it is exclusively violence, and one of the commandments is thou shalt not murder, and to enjoy vicariously the act of murder and take pleasure in those who do them, you are committing the sin themselves. And if you feel this applies to films with gratuitous murder and fictional characters committing those murders, then you would, of course, be committing a sin. So this is a Dungeons and Dragons movie, and if you're not familiar with the franchise, that is essentially a dark fantasy tabletop role-playing game. So there is a lot of uh, demonology, witchcraft, and, you know, occult symbolism. This is the Disney Marvelization of Dungeons & Dragons, so this film will have, of course, a gratuitous amount of PG-13 violence and swearing, as you would expect from a Marvel film. I think, for me personally, I'm gonna put this in the marketplace. However, I feel like if you want to and you don't feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit or the tickling in your conscience, then it might be fine. It is all very fictionalized, stylized, idealized fantasy, so go with the dictates of your spirit. No, one, no man can do anymore. Quite frankly, the existence of this movie in the year 2023 feels like an enigma. It feels like it's been a lot longer than it really has been since the last time we got an honest-to-goodness good versus evil adventure story for children that didn't feel the need to overcomplicate a simple moral idea or push some kind of uh, immoral adult agenda. But apparently Shigeru Miyamoto is the last bastion of wholesome family entertainment of the Mario franchise, which even in film form apparently, with the overview of Nintendo, has retained the Mario business model of clean, quality, family fun. You know, when you really boil it all down, the Christian religion is centered around the everyman who came from the stars to save his bride from a dragon. So in a lot of ways, this film's plot is going to hit very close to home. This one as well was important to talk about solely because it does deal not only with a mixed family and a judo-Christian culture debate, but also because as a parent, this film does deal quite a bit with the early stages of puberty, and that's something you might not be ready to show to your child. Now, George Foreman, the man himself, at least from what we know of him in the public eye and those who know him, is in of himself pure, lovely, and of good report. He is a wonderful Christian man. I, and for that reason, I am personally excited for this film to see the origin story of such a charitable man. This is, of course, not about his origin. This is about his time in the boxing ring. So what applied to our boxing and biopic movies earlier applies to this one. Potential PG-13 violence in the ring, potential language. I don't think anything else, though. Okay. Rats in Space 3, hooray. But before we get into the hooraying, something I want to talk about in the Guardians franchise is that as of the second film, we have now entered Gnostic territory. What this means is that the writers have deemed it cool and hip to use the narrative to vilify God, something that was reinforced a lot, especially in the latter half of Phase 3 and Phase 4 of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. This film does deal with a character named the High Evolutionary, who is, as the trailers say, unhappy with the way things are. So my personal advice would to be very watchful with this film, and if you do end up seeing it, go in with a prayered up heart. In the Book of Psalms, David makes it very clear that above all else, a righteous woman is one of the most valuable things on this earth. Solomon, who himself said 
in the book of Ecclesiastes that out of the thousand righteous men he's known, not one woman has he known. And yet still, he went out of his way to ensure that the love letters written between him and a pure woman in the house of Israel were recorded. And hidden in this record of this relationship between this man and this woman is one of the most poignant descriptions of the love that God harbors for man. So just personally, when the Fast and the Furious franchise repeatedly uses women as a trophy or some type of lustful background decoration while insisting the films are somehow about family is something that, frankly, at least for me personally, irks me very much. And on that note, the hyper-exaggerated fantastical nature that the Fast franchise applies to essentially risking your life for fun, I just... I can't find any type of value in that. I don't think, even compared to some of the harsher made films out there, I could sit and watch this with Jesus and turn to him and say that there was something of good report that I got while watching this. The Little Mermaid primarily pushes two messages which I can't go for. The first is that Walt Disney Animation, rather than creating a new character and adding more seats to the table, has decided that the message they want to push to the youth is that there is only one seat at the table. There is only one seat at the table. And that rather be judged or related to by the contents of your character, you should seek to define yourself by how you see your skin color in the world. I agree that Hollywood needs more wonderful black role models. I think 2018's Miles Morales, as well as the selfless King of Wakanda, Chadwick Boseman's Black Panther, were wonderful examples of that. But when The Little Mermaid is examined, it's doing quite the opposite, and is in fact a very hateful movie. You might be wondering why some relatively big-name releases, such as Bo is Afraid or the new Evil Dead film, were not included in this video. And primarily, the reason for that is because I realized upon reflection while editing this video that it's not my job, nor would God tell me it's my job to be your dad. I'm not here to tell you what you should look at or hear. My job here isn't to tell you that looking at gore is wrong, or to look after a woman to lust after her is to commit the sin of adultery. What I'm seeking to do here is tell you what the label isn't. Because the world is going to see PG-13 and they're going to think that means this film doesn't have much violence. But the Christian man and woman should be looking at this film and saying, what is the message? The Bible itself and the parables of Christ are filled with some very graphic stories. Case in point, the book of Judges, for example, and parables of Christ, like for example, the Good Samaritan or the tenants of the vineyard who beat a man to death simply for a small amount of property. But these violent stories served a purpose. They weren't there to glorify the acts of violence. The acts of violence were there to push a message that would enrich your life. Yes, the Good Samaritan was beaten and left on the side of the road, which is a very graphic image. But at the end of the story, there's the light of a man helping out his neighbor. And from the perspective of some in that town, his enemy simply out of the goodness of his heart and the principles of God's law. And that's what this video is really all about. Test the doctrine. What is this movie saying? Why does Wally have the last survivor of human pollution left alone for a thousand years on a planet by himself, giving a plant forbidden by the guiding mechanism of a city in the sky to a woman named Eve to cast them out of that city called the Axiom, which is Latin for law, to build a new life by the sweat of their brow on the earth. 
This story is the story of Genesis and Revelation backwards. We are leaving the New Jerusalem to come back to Satan's paradise. A lot of people would say, but that wasn't the point. The point was to turn your brain off and enjoy the movie. But as a Christian, why would you ever turn your brain off? When you take down the wall, the enemy can enter. And that's all I really have to say for now. Remember, instead of just taking my advice on what to watch, go into everything you do, whether it be watching a movie, driving to work, doing your homework, making dinner. Take everything you do to the Lord in prayer. Godspeed and have a wonderful day. Do you know subscribe to Spirit Life? My mom!